Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Um, I really felt very impressed that I had to take one of the statements in the video at the beginning that we put together. Um, because sometimes, you know, you can watch something like that and it all sounds very good and well, but, but then people will say, well, I don't even know what that means. And we can think, well, I think that's obvious, but people are saying, I, I don't know what it means. And there's a line at the beginning there, it says, when you know who you are, you know what to do. And I thought, you know, I'm going to take that um, just to, to talk about it a little bit, because I don't know about you, who, who knows who, that, who they are in here tonight? I mean, <laughs> me and Danny were having a talk about it the other day. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I'm, I'm 58 years old. I don't worry about telling people my age. I'm not embarrassed or anything. But I know that over 58 years, uh, I still haven't really found, found out who I really am. Um, I, I have a gain on it and then, I, then something will happen and I'll change and situations will happen to me that, that make me uh, a bit weird in the sense that I go into a self-protection mode. You know, you know what it's like and you think, well, I shouldn't be like this, I need to be something else. And you know, you recognize that you're changing all the time and being different and I'm sure that if you know, I live another 10 years, I'll be something different in 10 years time. And I think that's what it's meant to be really. However, if it's important that we find out who we are in order to know what we do, then we've got a problem if we're always forever changing. So that's got to mean something more than what I've just said. And uh, what I find really interesting is that we can get so hung up, especially in psychology. I love psychology. I, I, it makes me buzz because I like to read about all the, you know, the different things that they've come up with to try and explain who we are and how we come to who we are. And it's just so very, very interesting. And, um, you know, one of the, the big issues of who we are comes from identity, isn't it? It's how do I identify myself in order that I am very different from you? That's really the, what ident who I am and who you are uh, needs to be identified. And words like uh, me, mine, my, are all the words, aren't there, that we identify ourselves with. And uh, what I found really interesting when I was just sort of looking at, at this is that basically a child figures out who it is very, very early on. Because uh, I don't know whether you're, you're aware of this, but when a child is born, they have no understanding of themselves being different from the mother. This is absolutely the truth. You know, you can go and look it up. The mother and the child are actually one being. So when the child is moving its arm, it doesn't think I am moving my arm. It says the world is moving its arm or mum's moving the arm or we're all moving it together because it doesn't have an I yet. It doesn't have a me. as I'm talking a load of rubbish. It doesn't have a me or an I. So, so it, it's totally connected to its mother. And then you all know what happens. It starts to understand that it's an I and you are a you. And then there's the fight starts, right? And so then we, we start to think, what do I need to be in order to survive in this world? Don't know whether you've thought about that very much, but all of our things that we, we become as adults is everything we've put in place as children to survive. And you think, oh, that's not true. I had a wonderful childhood or whatever. But in fact, life is, is difficult. And even kids in the most wonderful environments have got to figure out, how do I survive this? And you know, a child, if, if they are left for any length of time, that's why there was a big issue over whether you leave, lived, leave children to cry or not for a long time. There was a big debate about it. And they came to the conclusion it wasn't a good idea. 
Because the baby does not understand time. And so when they are crying because the mother's gone, they don't think, mum will be back in a minute because it has no understanding of time. So it thinks that it's actually been abandoned forever. Woo, isn't that something to think about? So you can imagine if a little child has been left crying for a very long time and then it gets to three and four years old and it's clingy, you wonder why? Because in its mind, it was abandoned because I could be left forever. So there's some incredible things that we learn what makes us who we are. Now, we could spend hours talking about this. And Anth was brilliant last week when he was talking about our pursuit of love, how we all want to be loved. So what we do to get that love is what makes us who we are. Even if we really aren't it, we will do it in order to be loved. So that means that we come up with all these various identities in order to get what we want, right? So if we have to know who we are in order to know what to do, we've got a big problem. Wouldn't you agree? Unless it's much, much simpler than that. And I actually believe it is. I think we're very complicated, but I actually think it's very simple. And do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna get to the point straight away. Bring that gorgeous little baby up here. We're going to have a star of the show tonight, and it's a little chap called Jacob. Give him a hand. Don't, don't scare him to death. <laughs> and I want to leave this vision with you. I'll talk about some other things, but I want to... This little chap here, who is he? Who is he? He's Jacob. Give me more. Who is he? Very good, Kelly's son. Who else? What else? Grandson, right? So we've got, we, we're, we've got to three things that we're identifying. Grandson, Shirley's grandson. What else? He's a boy. What else? Great grandson. Great grandson, awesome, awesome. Brilliant. I love that answer because that's where we're getting to, actually. And you're getting ahead of me, but that's brilliant. I'm really glad. But come on, in this little exercise, give me some... Hello. You are gorgeous. You are. Look at that. Any more? Any more for any more? What? Friend? Okay. But does he know what friendship is yet? Probably not, and I'm not being difficult, but I'm just really wanting to say that probably four or five identifiable things this little child has. He is a son of Kelly and Kev. He is the great grandson of Eunice. He is the grandson of Shirley. He is a boy. Not much we can say of him other than that but he's loved. Right, so he doesn't have to be anything more than this to be absolutely loved. Right, now we, this is the end of my preach tonight. The Bible talks about unless you become as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And we say, oh no, that's ridiculous. That, that's, how can this little child enter the kingdom of heaven? It's because all he needs to know is that he's loved and he'll know what to do. What will he know what to do? He'll know how to receive the love of mum, Kev, great-grandma, grandma. Do, do you get my point? How can he be anything deserving at this time, in this little state? He can't. And yet we all want to be something that says that I'm deserving. So I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other. But then it all gets terrible because then we'll say, I'm not this, I'm not that. So it becomes very condemning. So on the one hand, we are wonderful things that we say, oh, this is brilliant. I am this and I am that. Then the next breath, I'm not enough, I'm rubbish in everything. So where, who are we? Who are we? But if we become as a, what 
little child, knowing the love of father, the love of mother, the simplicity of that. So if I was to ask you who you are tonight, could you say what he said? Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Phil, Phil, isn't it? Yeah. He said, a child of the universe, absolutely awesome, simple as that, who is absolutely loved by someone beyond measure for no other reason that you're born of, of it, him. Call it what you want. It, him. Do you get it? Well, I think it deserved more than that. Didn't it deserve more than that? Thank you. Thank you for being my star. That was going to be the end. But I did it at the beginning because I thought, why not just go the end? So here's my point. All of you are seeking to know who you are. I'm this, I'm that, you know. And I, we could go through a whole thing about how we find out our identity, even in the context of young people. And you young people over here, it's called either commitment there's two ways that we, we uh, identify ourselves. One is commitment. The other one is exploration, right? And some people have got really high levels of exploration and low commitment. Others have got high commitment and low exploration. Like, I'm going to find it because I'm going to talk to you about it a little bit. Let me have a look because I think you'll like this. I have to jump around because I never know where I am. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, let me have a look. Right, okay. Uh, no, I, I can't find it. Where are we? Oh, here we go. Right, this is how we decide our identity based on two things, this commitment and exploration. Some of us commit too quick to things without any exploration. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Oh, I'm going to become a doctor because my... See if you can answer the question. Because my dad was. Isn't that brilliant? So they never have any idea to do something for themselves. They commit. I think you can say of me, Joel, we're in the church. Why? Because my dad was. Oh, come on. Look, look at me as though I'm crazy. Come on. How many of you are doing things because? Right. Come on. So that's high commitment, low exploration. And so we get to the point where we've fixed who we are dead early on because we've decided it was good enough for them. It's good enough for me. So I'm a bit, that's it. Do you get it? Not all of us, We're, we all are different, but I'll put my hand up to that one. Heck, you know. Right, others, listen to this, can't commit to anything as there is always something else to be explored. Life is just so much fun to get tied down. So you get a person like, for instance, a good idea, a, a, a perpetual student. Do you know people who are still going to university at 50? Why? Because they still haven't decided what they want to do. And they'll think, oh, I'll tell you what. I'll, oh, I'll do something else now. And they go and sign on another course. And Why? Because there's something more still to explore, right? The other thing, others can't commit and also don't explore. Just imagine that. Somebody who doesn't commit to anything but also doesn't explore. You can imagine a very, very dissatisfied person. Can you, can you feel it? Like, I'm not going to try. I'm, not, I'm just, it's like a grey world, isn't it? Grey world. Um, they come out with things like, well, I just don't know. Well, it doesn't really make much difference anyway, does it? Can you hear it? That's what people do. Oh, I can take it or leave it. Ah, oh, it's no big deal. Get it? Identity formation. Others can com commit to some arenas and also fully explore in other arenas, which is wonderful, isn't it? If I can be committed to this, but I can also be committed to that and still be looking around. This is how we sort of build ourselves up. Okay, is that making sense? Okay, then there's the nature-nurture debate, isn't there? Oh, what have I learned? I'll tell you what, the stuff I've learned in my life that, oh, I've had to unlearn so much Unlearn it because, like I say, I fixed my identity probably way too early in my life without exploring very much. And so there's a lot of things that I've had to, um, to really tear down and, and, and think about. Okay, I've got ahead of myself. So let's look at this. How about the, also the fact that we have a true self, because Danny and I were talking about this the other day. 
There's that true self that we, we know who we are inside. We know our skills, we know our faults. And if we have a, an accurate assessment of ourselves, then actually we're okay. But isn't it true that most of the time we don't have an accurate assessment of ourselves? We're either, we're either very um, uh, overstating of what we are or we understate what we are. We can't just be accurate about, uh, accurate about it at, at all. I find that really interesting. And then of course, there's, there's, there's the me that I, I feel I want to be or should be. And then there's the me that others want me to be. And then there's the me I don't want to be. Then there's the me that I think God wants me to be. And then of course, there's always the me I pretend to be. Isn't this complicated? Now, this is where I should have started before I brought Little and Up, but I wanted to just use him. Because if, if this is what it takes to know what to do, then we're in real trouble because our identities are changing so often. And like we said at the beginning, the answer to that question is when we know who we are, it is a very simplistic thing of knowing that we're totally loved. And I want to just go to a story, if that's okay, just to um, look at this a little bit more. And it's Matthew 3, verse 16 in the NIV, please. And uh, it just basically covers this. Are you putting it up or am I just going to read it? As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water and at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I loved, with him I am pleased. Now, I don't know whether at that time Jesus knew who he was or whether he was on that journey of figuring things out as he you know, li lived his life and he came to a revelation of who he was. But that word coming down from heaven, that according to the, the Bible, four of the uh, Gospels actually record this event. So it's not just recorded by one, it's recorded by them all. So obviously something either happened or it was talked about enough to, for everybody to want to put a, um, uh, what do you call it, a, a record of it. Thanks, Danny, for helping me there. Um, but you see, the issue, he could have said at that time, okay, what have I done to deserve this title? What have I done? It says, if you look at the, the uh, scriptures, that he actually only started doing any miracles after that time. So up to this point, he'd basically just been an ordinary son, in inverted commas, of a carpenter, living in a, a little rural town, just basically living a very normal life. And he goes to be baptized because basically that's what other people were doing at the time. And scripture had sort of said that he was going to be baptized by John, so he was fulfilling what had been prophesied. But up to that point, what had he done to deserve that title? The point was nothing. And if you will take on board that those words have been spoken over you the same way that they were spoken over Jesus, it will absolutely revolutionize your life. And instead of you trying to figure out what you need to be, do this, that, and the other, you will hear those words, this is my son whom I love, I am pleased You'll say, yeah, but I'm not a son, I'm a daughter. Well, the reason why they used the word son in that time was because sons inherited, right? Girls were rubbish, you didn't get now, you know, so you were just forgotten about. But you see, what was happening in this new revolution that Jesus was bringing in, which is actually another line that we say in, in the uh, video, it says, Jesus offers a revolutionary lifestyle, which is part of the emancipation of people who had no right to be anything, which were, in that time was women, right? He called everybody sons. Because he's saying, I'll tell you what, I'm bringing you into the, the, the situation where you're all going to be inheritors rather than, you know, 
Guys getting it all and women just basically being the washer-uppers. Aren't you glad things have changed? Yeah. So, that's said over you. God said, you're my son. And what's really going on there is there's a recognition of the relationship that basically says it all. It's, you're not God, you're actually Father. And, and God is saying, I'm not, I'm Father and you're my son. So the, the, the God Jesus thing suddenly sort of out the window. There's this lovely personal thing. And it's not about title, but it's about relationship. And that's what's being said over you. And that's why you can have that piece of information and know this is all I need to know who I am. And then it leads us to know what to do. Now, it's an interesting thing. I brought it a little bit last week. He talked about um, that there can be a confusion and it's Probably church language, but the, the fact that God loves us has usually been tagged onto a statement that when you talk to people, it's God loves you and he has a plan for your life. And when I say that this, uh, that when you know who you are, you know what to do, I don't want you to get confused with that statement because it's nothing to do with God having a plan for your life. When we talk about when you know who you are, you'll know what to do. It's not about doing in the context of, should I have this job? Should I be an astronaut? Should I be a teacher? Should I marry this person? Should I, whatever. It's about know what to do in the context of how to be and live in the context of the kingdom. Because what happens after this is that it says, and Jesus then went off into the wilderness. And guess what was going to happen according to the story? And you see, some of you might say, well, was it true? Does it, you know, is it, is it actually a true story? I don't really care, if, in all honesty. The point is, we can learn from everything. There's lessons. What is the meaning in this? What's trying to be said? And what it, it says in the story is that, see, Jesus then goes into the wilderness and he is tempted. Now, we all know about the temptations, you know, the tempted to st turn stones into bread, tempted to throw yourself off a high building and be saved, tempted that if he would worship, um, as it happens, the story is that it's Satan, but I could actually give you enough sort of evidence to say that he was actually battling with him himself, who he was. He was fighting over his identity. Who am I? Right? He's just been told who he is. You're my son. I'm pleased with you. I love you. And then he goes into the wilderness where he has to battle it out. What, what to do to prove that he believed what, we, what was said in the first place? And I'll tell you what, you guys go through situations where you'll hear that voice and it'll be, hey girl. You're my, you're my daughter. You know, you're my son in that sense. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and you'll hear the words, oh, I, I love you. And you'll be singing, yeah, you're a good father and I'm loved by you. That's who I am. And then suddenly you go into the wilderness. Oh, and the temptation comes and the stuff happens. And guess what? You don't know what to do. Why? Because you forget who you are. Because you suddenly think, oh, who am I? Oh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other, I'm this. No, you're a son, you're loved by God, and he's pleased with you. And so you know what to do, how to be. Do you know what I, I find as well interesting? That you know when somebody doesn't know that they're loved by how they struggle to love other people. <laughs> it's really interesting. You can see it. You, you, you can see the struggle that's going on. So they don't know how to be and they don't know what to do because they've actually not received the word that says, you're my son, I'm pleased with you. You're loved. Sorry. There's only three things and I still can't remember them all, can I? So anyway, so, so he goes into the, the wilderness and what you, you find in that incredible difficult temptation 
He knew what to do based on knowing who he was. And that, there's another wonderful thing to just remind you here, is that according to the New Testament, Jesus never refers to God in any other way but Father. In the Old Testament, there's all these names, there's all these clever titles that the Jewish people carried on into the New Testament, still calling him by the Old, uh, Old Testament names, but Jesus doesn't. And you see, the reason that's incredible is because to the Pharisees and to the, the, the uh, powers that be in those days, they'd even decided by that time that the name of God couldn't even be spoken. That's how holy it was. And then suddenly you've got Jesus not just talking about God in the sense of this word that you've got to be careful with and it's so holy that you can hardly say it. He actually has the audacity to call him dad. Isn't that just fantastic? Now I think that most of us have trouble in here because we're still struggling with the dad God syndrome. Do you think? I know, listen, for years I... I have this, and, and when I'm in leaders' meetings, these guys laugh at me because I'll come out with something and they'll say, what? And I think it must be just me. It must be just me. There's some of the things that I was taught that I really didn't have a good image of God in, in my life, and yet I was the, the, the daughter of a, a minister, but I didn't have a good vision of him. And I always believed that somehow I'd be the one who always got caught, or I'd be always the one who'd be in trouble, and that was an awful experience to have. And it took me till I was 44 years of age before I had an encounter with what I now understand is the love of God. Why? Because I actually allowed the words to be enough, to be enough. Because otherwise, I wasn't enough. I was still going to have to look at what, how I could improve this and how I could get this better. And I mean, honestly, yeah. I mean, when I said at the beginning about how do we define who we are? I mean, if you've stolen, just, are you a thief? You know, if you've murdered somebody, are you a murderer? How do you rid yourself from the condemnation of that? You have to say, do you know what? Whether it's success or failure, the point is that does not make me who I am. Who I am is the fact that the word has been spoken over me. You are my son. I love you and I'm pleased with you. Now, the reason why I said at the beginning about we have to be willing to go back uh, to be a little child is because just like I brought with Jacob, then I hope you can get that picture. When you're feeling in that situation where you don't know what to do, will you just actually be willing to humble yourself and become little Jacob? What can he do for himself other than trust the love of his father and his mother? What else can he do? And I'll tell you something else you'll, you'll be interested in. For many, many years uh, in this church and, you know, in other similar churches, we didn't ever do infant baptisms because we always believed that a person would have to be of a, an age where they made up their own mind, made a decision to say, I want to follow Jesus and be baptized because they chose. It all sounds very nice, that, doesn't it? But even then you think, yeah. It's saying, I am, listen to what it's saying, I am in a place where I understand that I commit to follow Jesus and I'm going to lay down my life and give it to the, come on, isn't that a bit proud and boastful? I don't know if I could ever say that anymore now. But that's what I mean. How do you live up to such things? Do you know what's amazing about infant baptisms? It's little Jacob. It's little Jacob. What can he do to, to earn? What can he do to deserve? And so what we do, do is to get baptized then because we actually say, he's chosen, he's in. Because God says, not him. Oh. And nobody wants to do that because they say, oh, that, yeah, but that's not right. We can't decide whether a person's in or not. 
guess who decides who's in? The word of the Father that says, See? This is my son. Okay. Story of the two sons. Luke 15. I love this line. I better feel, uh, yeah, I go too fast, don't I? Little story. A man had two sons. Remember what we said about sons? They inherit. And so they both went to dad. Sorry, one of them went to dad and said, look, give me my inheritance. I want to go and play. So we've got a player and we've got a stay-at-homer. And what's interesting, their identities are totally different. One stays at home, resentful as anything, hates his life, but he stayed at home. The other one's gone off, having great fun, spent all his money, gets into a right mess, right? Because he realizes, well, that's run out now, what am I gonna do? Then we get to this most wonderful verse, and it says this, verse 17. When he came to his senses, that brilliant. He came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, and we know this story, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. See, up until that time, he'd forgotten who he was. Because you see, the story shows that the father every day is looking. See, is he still the father's son? And you see, the attitude of the sons, one's in a mess, one, if he was to analyze who he was, is basically a homeless beggar sat in deep gaga, right? That's who he is. You can't put a decent thing around that. This is it. This is his lot. A homeless beggar or is someone's son. Ha! Which? That's why he had to come to his senses. Because one minute he was a homeless beggar because he'd forgotten that he was someone's. The attitude of the father didn't change whether you're a resentful son in the house, still his son, or whether you're one a homeless beggar, still the son. Now, how do I wrap this up? We can all be striving for perfection. We can be striving to become something. We can look at our ta talents, you see. Talents are only a way of you showing the love that God has put on you. You know, Danny, when you play the piano, when we sing, when we do the stuff we do, it's a vehicle by which we show we're loved, isn't it? That's all it is. Forgotten where I am now. Does it matter? <laughs> right, this is what I want to end with. As we mature, I don't like that word mature. I think there's too much, uh, I don't know, weight put on it. We all feel we need to grow up, don't we? And yet what I've noticed is as we grow up, what tends to happen, we, like we talked at the beginning about our me, my, mine, we become very individual, right? And if you think about it, as Jacob grows up, he's going to become less dependent on parents and therefore assume things because of that separation. So we can become, as we get older, we can lose confidence in an unconditional love that exists. Why? Because we know that there are things that we have done that are, that's unacceptable. Isn't that true? Come on. As we grow up, we know that we, maybe we, we shouldn't have done what we did and then we think, well, you know, I've upset so-and-so and this, that and the other. And because we're conditional beings, we then project that onto Father and assume that Father is going to be conditional back with us. But that's not true. And I want to sort of have a bit of a, what's the word? A rebellion. Let's have a rebellion about being so mature 
that we are no longer willing to be the little child who totally trusts in the unconditional love of the Father. Right? Because we want to, when we start saying, oh, but you know, I'm this now. And, and there's another thing. Isn't it interesting? As we grow up, we feel that our parents then expect more of us. Oh, well, you know, we expect you now to go, go it on your own. And can I tell a story? Can I tell something about you? Can I? I don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass Joel. No, I'm not. Um, when we were in the States this last time, Joel went off to uh, America as well. He arrived in Vegas and we were up in Washington. And as it happened, the phone rang. And uh, <laughs> he was panicking like you wouldn't believe. Because something had gone wrong in his booking of no fault of his own, um, but for car hire. And when he got to the desk, they basically wanted about another 1,200 quid or something, didn't they? For, for a, a car hire. And he's going... I've paid, you know, I've paid for it. I don't want to pay anymore. He phones us. And what is the first thing that good parents do? Is it, well, you stupid idiot. You've got yourself in a right mess, isn't it? You know, you've got yourself into that mess. Pull yourself out. Is that what we do? Some of you are going to say yes. <laughs> well, I might be a walkover. But I ain't going to do that. My, my boy needed help. Do I have the money? No. I'll tell you what, I can get more than he probably can, so I can borrow it. Are you following me? So what am I going to do? I'm going to put myself out to help my son. Why? Because he's loved and I'm pleased with him and I don't want to see him struggle, right? But you see, we then... The scripture goes, if we being evil, now I don't like that word evil because it portrays like you know, nasty, horrible, be slimy pieces of work. No, but if we being evil in the sense that we're not as good as God, still know how to be good to our kids, how much more will he not freely give us all things? Now, afterwards, you know, I'm gets on the phone, he's talking to the woman, he's, he's basically giving her a credit card, trying to sort, and it was sorted, wasn't it? And all of a sudden, you think, oh, there you go, sorted. He went on to have his holiday, we went back into the meeting that we were supposed to be in, because we were in a meeting at the time, phone rings. Now, I haven't said that to impress anybody. I, I'm saying it to say, if that's how we feel, if that's how we feel, Shouldn't we expect at least the same of our heavenly Father? Now, I wish that everything we do here in all our songs and everything, we could get rid of the word God, <laughs> get rid of so many words, because it's so hindering of our understanding that his dad, I'm his son, he's pleased with me. And that is who you are. And when you know who you are, you know what to do. Remember, what to do is about expressing that same love that's been given to you to whosoever. Yeah? So when we know who we are, who are you? Come on, who are you? I expect an answer. Who are you? You're a son, you're loved, and he's pleased with you. Next time you're in a bit of a difficult situation and you're looking to yourself to bail you out, will you stop and think, Jacob, I will be that little child. I will allow myself to be loved. I won't be so mature that I have to bail myself out and be something that I don't have to be. I just have to be loved. Yeah? Um, let's sing that, then I shall... I then shall live. This is a lovely song. We, we introduced it a few weeks ago and I want to sing it as a declaration of what it means, what we mean by know what to do. The words go, I then shall live as one who's been forgiven. I'll walk with joy to know my debts are paid. I know my name is clear before who? God, no. My father, dad. I am his child and I am not afraid. So greatly pardon, I'll forgive my brother. See, these, this is the do. I know what to do. 
The law of love I'll gladly obey. I know what to do. Obey the law of love. I then shall live as one who's learned compassion. Oh, isn't it hard sometimes to be compassionate to people who drive you up the wall? Come on. We're not pretending in this place. We've been real. It's hard. But we know what to do. We learn compassion. I've been so loved that I'll risk loving too. I know how fear builds walls instead of bridges. We know what to do. Let's tear them down. I'll dare to see another's point of view. And when relationships demand commitment, then I'll be there to care and follow through. We know what to do. And then we sing at the end, your kingdom come. See, the kingdom isn't about this powerful thing where there is a king and, and he's riding, you know, it's like the revelation. He's riding his horse and, you know, there's blood and guts everywhere because he's leading us into battle. No, what's happening? The kingdom is one where there's lots of compassion, lots of forgiveness, lots of love, lots of kindness. That's the kingdom. And sometimes we just can't go along with each other, can we? <laughs> Your power and glory, let them shine through me. Your hallowed name, oh, may I bear with honour and may your living kingdom come in me. Let's stand, let's, if you don't know it, it doesn't matter, but at least just look at the words and think, that's what she means when she says we know what to do. Yeah? Is that okay? Come on then.
Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.